A good morning, everyone. Just getting the program together here this morning. It's a beautiful 29 degrees here at the uh, studios of Jim Hinckley's America. Within the spitting distance of Route 66 in Kingman, Arizona. Good morning, Miss Maggie. Let's see if we can get this thing going a little better than we did last week with a few little problems, but uh, nothing serious. There, are you there? I am, Bob. How are you doing this morning? Damn, I wish you had told me I had to jump through all those hoops to get on the goddamn post. <laughs> <laughs> we're not on the air, are we? Yes, we are. <laughs> oh, good. Well, you'll have to bleep that. I'm sorry. Ah, you're fine, Bob. Just give me one second. We'll have this all set to go. <laughs> Say hello to a new friend on an Take a two-lane trip of memories Into mysteries unknown Come along for the ride Jim Hinckley's America Jim Hinckley's America A little music there from Joe and Woody and the boys of the road crew. You can tell we're going to have some fun this morning. We've got uh, author and artist Bob Bose Bell with us this morning, which is always entertaining. Mr. Bob, how are you doing down there, Cave Creek? You know, we've had a really wet month. I don't know up there in uh, Kingman. You, I think you got a lot of snow, didn't you? We've had a touch of snow, uh, a little bit of rain. It's uh, the flowers are just spectacular, but. Uh, it's it it's we we need a lot more. It's still so dry. We're going to be hunting jerky instead of deer, unless we uh, <laughs> we, we get a bit uh, bit much bit more rain this year. Yeah, well, I uh, we we needed the rain here, and it's made for really dramatic skies. And <clears throat> I'm a painter, so I uh, I've been going kind of nuts. So the skies have been fantastic. I just love your photographs in the morning and your artwork and and. Uh, but for Bob is uh, well, kind of a legend, I guess, wouldn't you say? Bob is an artist, an author, uh, and you're as good at telling people where to go as I am, if not better. You've had more experience. <laughs> I'm telling people where to go. Yeah, well, I grew up in a gas station, so that'll that'll help, you know. I was going through your book uh, this morning again, the '66 Kid, and if you're a Route 66 enthusiast, you know I highly recommend this. It gives you a good uh, snapshot of life on small town America and on Route 66 a few years back, more years ago than we'd probably like to count. You know, I uh, 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 I never got it when I uh, when I grew up because uh, my uh, mother worked for the highway department, and my father had Al Bell's flying in Route 66, and so we made our living off the road. And so even when the TV show started this, you know, Route 66, I thought, well, that's weird uh, uh, that, that this <clears throat> road is kind of getting this notoriety. And about uh, five years ago, I was uh, my wife was stationed in Spain. She works for the Department of Defense. And so I went over there and she was in Rota. And uh, Rota is um, uh, where Columbus set off on his second journey to the Americas and when he brought horses and cattle. And so as a historian and you know, uh, being the executive editor of True West Magazine, I thought, well, I'm going to find Cowboy Ground Zero because if you can find where all those conquistadors came from in Spain uh, and then they come over here, the vaquero begets the cowboy, I thought, I'm going to find Cowboy Ground Zero. So I'm standing on the beach in Rhoda and I'm looking out at that angry ocean 
And I'm thinking about those guys leaving them three wooden boats, you know, and I'm going, man, those guys had some cojones. That, this is amazing. And then about uh, after about five minutes of that, I turned to leave. And as I turned, I looked right at the, be at the, at the uh, beachfront and there <clears throat> was the Route 66 bar. And I went, oh, I get it. I get it. They said horses over here to change our world. And then we changed their world and said, here's a compliment. And we gave them back the legend of Route 66. So at that moment, I got it. You know, it's funny. I My folks tease me that I was potty trained along the road. We, we drove it so much. And uh, even into the 90s, it was just a road. I, I even was decommissioned. It was being bypassed. I enjoyed driving it because I liked the Cattleman Cafe in Truxton and I, I liked the simple things. And the other part of it was I was driving a 1946 GMC and they wouldn't let me on the interstate highway because about 45 miles an hour was top end. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's mind boggling. Just this evening as an example, I've got uh, dinner with Dries Bessels, uh, the president of the Dutch Route 66 Association will be here in Kingman. And it's still, it, it's just amazing. It's a road for God's sakes, but yet it's taken on this just mad. Uh, yeah. It's just, just a stunning. Yeah, it really is. And, um, you know, I, I remember uh, uh, my first job was icing jugs at my dad's uh, Al Bell's Flying A. And we had a big sign out front that said jugs ice free. And so, my dad said, you know, it's time for you to go to work. And I was like, oh, great. You know, summer vacation, there's that. But uh, anyway, four guys attacked every car. And they, and they were all wearing, the three guys were wearing uniforms with their name over their heart. And they had caps on. I mean, <laughs> when you think back on it now, it's just like ridiculous, you know. And the first guy would uh, wash all your windows all the way around. And, the, and he would say, fill it with flight fuel, sir. And because uh, we had, we had, uh, you know, you could, if you put this gas in your car, you could fly, baby. And then the second guy would uh, check all the, the tires all the way around and he, and he would warn you, uh, he said, I better check that uh, spare in the trunk uh, because you're going to go across the most deadly desert in the world. And then the uh, third guy would go under the hood and cut all the fan belts. So that, was, <laughs> that, that that's the legend of Route 66. But I was the fourth guy. I had my Little League cap on. I played right field for the odd fellow Yankees in my spare time. And then I uh, and I would say, do you have any jugs you'd like iced? And they would uh, everybody carried a thermos in their car. There was no AC in cars. And so they would give me a thermos, all different kinds. And I would go into the lube room. And my father had bought a um, an ice machine, uh, and and I would put ice in there. And I worked for tips, and I, I would get um, like a quarter every you know every car. And I found that uh, Texans tip the best, and teachers tip the worst. I, <laughs> uh, oh gosh, you have had so much fun with that uh, jugs iced comment. Uh, there's a fellow back in Missouri that you, you should get to know is a uh, Louie Keen. He's got, uh, he bought an old uh, truck stop and topless bar. Uh, in of course. Of, of, course, <laughs> of course, those two things go together. Truck stop and topless bar. That, that well, Yeah, of course they do. <laughs> well, he, uh, he uh, converted it. It was in Uranus, Missouri. Well, and of course it was in Uranus. <laughs> and he's converted this into one of the most amazing roadside stops you've ever seen. His first thing he did was open a fudge company. And he has uh, the Uranus Fudge Company. All the juvenile. <laughs> now, you, you got to be making this up now, Jim. Now, you're, just not, you're off the rails here. This is ridiculous. Well, I think it gets worse. All the juvenile humor that goes with it. But what you'd really appreciate is uh, he bought the county newspaper because it was going broke and he relocated it up to Uranus and he renamed it the Uranus Examiner. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be that guy when I grow up. That That is the, that is the, the most heartening, enlightening, hilarious anecdote I've ever heard this early in the morning. This is fantastic. He is a character. He is an absolute character. Uranus Examiner. It doesn't get any better than that. That. 
Oh, that is uh, that was worth the phone call right there, young man. Bob, you know your work to separate the myth of and and try to preserve real Western frontier history is just really commendable. And True West Magazine is a national treasure. I got to tell you, I, yeah, I, thank you. I I have been a fan of that magazine since I was a uh, gosh. Well, I used to buy used copies when I was a kid, but new ones when I could afford it. Uh, and I, I just, I've been a fan for years, and I'm so glad of, uh, proud of your work on this. Thank you. Uh, in fact, it was Route 66 that uh, really ignited my passion for the West because every summer my father would uh, take my mother and I and put it, pile us in the 57 Ford and drive uh, to Iowa to the fam to visit the family farm and. We would meet all the people westbound. We were going, you know, and they had inner tubes on the top and they were wearing bikinis and they were laughing. And we were Norwegians going to Iowa so we could eat <laughs> five times a day and talk about crops. And, uh, and, uh, and so we were uh, eastbound and I was standing on the transmission hump because there were no seat belts in those days. And um, they had these big signs, as you know, these, uh, they would go all the way across the of a mesa and it would say, uh, gas, 19.9, clean restrooms, world's largest buffalo, Whiting Brothers, you know. Remember those signs? And they were, I, God, I, yes. I just love those signs. And I'd go, hey, Dad, can we stop? <laughs> we go, yes. He would never stop. And so um, we got to Iowa, and uh, he, he always said, we, we got to make time, kid, you know. And he, he was the guy that, you know, World War II guy. We had to leave at 4 a.m. Yes. We had to drive for an hour. And we would always stop at the Copper Cart in Sligman, Arizona, and he would have the same thing that the waitresses almost recognized him, and they would say, "Oh, hi, Al. Two eggs over easy, bacon, toast, <laughs> <laughs> coffee, straight." Up. And so then um, we got to Iowa, and I picked out a place. Uh, I said, "Hey, Dad, you got to give me one place on the way back to Arizona." And he said, well, we will, kid, if we have time. Well, I knew what that meant. <laughs> we weren't stopping anywhere. So I hatched a devious plan. And at uh, Santa Rosa, New Mexico, I looked it up on the map. Uh, we were eating at the Club Cafe. And as we got, I came back on the car and I got out on the road, um, <clears throat> I, I started saying, come on, Dad, you promised. And he had his hands in the 10 and 2 position. And he was passing, you know, 10 trucks at a time. And I started poking him. Every dad has a weak spot that runs from the ear down to the shoulder. And I started poking him and right there. And I go, come on, dad, you promised. And he tried to shake me off and I would not give up. And he finally, we got to the Longhorn Museum, south side of the road, uh, 48 miles east of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And he pulled that seven Ford in that parking lot and put it in park. And he looked at me and he said, kid, you got 15 minutes. <laughs> so <laughs> it was the most precious 15 minutes of my life i went running into that museum and it was just full of all the stuff i love you know longhorns and guns and and you know ropes and all kinds of great stuff and my grandfather had given me a, a shiny quarter and he said hey buy something on the way home and so i was looking around and i said uh, hey sir how much for that flintlock rifle over there and he said a hundred dollars and i said i'll give you a quarter <laughs> I hadn't quite picked, I hadn't quite picked, figured out the horse trading thing yet. And then I looked around and <clears throat> I, I saw an authentic photo of Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. And I said, how much for this, sir? And he goes, a quarter. And so I paid it. And now my dad hustled me out the door and we got back in the car. Now he's got to get back out on Route 66 and catch all the trucks that got by us while we were in the museum. And I was in the back just mesmerized by this photograph I bought. A, a, a real photograph of Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. And I knew uh, enough about Old West history because my favorite magazine was True West. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother would go and get her subscription or prescription filled at um, Desert Drugs in downtown Kingman. And uh, so I'm just studying this photograph. My mom says, are you okay? Because I'm a talkative sort, as you might have guessed. And all the way through uh, Central on Albuquerque, uh, Laguna, Cabrero, uh, Holbrook, Winslow, don't stab, don't forget what, no, no, all the way home, I was studying that photo. And when we got home, we lived on Ash Fork Avenue in Kingman. 
And I put that photograph, uh, taped it up on, on the wall right next to the door. And I made a vow every morning. I'm going to, someday I'm going to have a hat like that. Someday I'm going to have boots like that. I was just so proud of that photo. And about two weeks later, we were at Desert Drug and I ran up to the front of the store to buy my latest issue of True West. And I went out to the car and, uh, on page 36, I discovered that the photograph I bought was a fake, and it was taken at a parade in Santa Fe in 1932, and that made me so angry that I had been duped, you know, and uh, and that really is what uh, lit the flame. I, I missed the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. I missed the hula hoop craze. I missed Watergate. I was in the library going, what do these guys really do? And that led to us buying True West Magazine in 1999 and moving it to Arizona. You know, Bob, the romanticism of the West, uh, oh gosh, you know, it just transformed generations, not just of American kids. I, when I was in Germany, I learned that uh, they tried to ban Bonanza or Gunsmoke uh, at one time, because when that came on, uh, business in nightclubs, restaurants, and was just plummeted. Wow. And, uh, people just, for me, when I, I'm from back East and uh, we moved out here in the summer of 66 and it wasn't just that we moved to Kingman. My pa had bought property sight unseen out along Oatman road near uh, cool Springs and S camp. And we moved out in the middle of the desert. And I, I thought it was the place they had warned me about in Sunday school, but I became so enamored with the romanticism, the people, the characters, the, 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 the Indians, and some of these old timers, uh, I just, I became one of the dry roasted nuts. I just, just am obsessed with the Southwest and the desert country. And that's why I'm such a fan of your work. Yeah. You know, the, uh, uh, people uh, ask me all the time. I'm sure you get this too. They'll, they'll say, uh, why aren't there shows like that on TV anymore? Although there, there is a return, you know, Taylor Sheridan with, uh, TV shows. God, he's got like five of them on now from Yellowstone to 1883 to 1923. Yeah. He's, doing, he's doing Bass Reeves right now. So we're in kind of a renaissance of uh, uh, Western storytellings, which I love, by the way. Uh, but uh, people want to know why the classic thing ended. And it's it's um, my answer is uh, here's the thing. Uh, we got to tell better stories. That's yes. That's, we got to tell that, that. That's my mantra now. I'm uh, I tell everybody this. I, I, we listen. We got to step up to the plate. We got to tell better stories. You can't just repeat the old stories. You know that that worked in 1955, 1965, but it doesn't really work for an audience today. And uh, so that's that's my feeling is that uh, hey, if you love it like we do, uh, you just got to tell better stories. You know, I uh, I really I, I got sucked into this whole romanticism of the West. I even tried rodeo for a while. It seemed like a good idea. I, I found out it was God's way of eliminating crazy people. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, they say the only reason to get a bull is if you want to meet a nurse. Uh, I could I did uh, bronc riding. I could get drunk enough to do bull riding. I just I just couldn't do that. And then I married into Judy with Judy's family. It was uh, always like a John Wayne film festival. And I was just in heaven with that. With uh, Our first family reunion was down in Tombstone. Her father was born in Tombstone. And um, his grandfather was the sheriff down there out of Cochise County. Wow. And uh, here on my desk, I have the 41 caliber Colt that he carried as a sheriff. And uh, yeah. Just the, the West is, that's infectious. Absolutely infectious. And I'm like you, I get frustrated. I don't care if it's Route 66, the Southwest, when history is made up or uh, we just tell stories so often that they're fact. Like the uh, story about Clark Gable and Carol Lombard uh, honeymooning at, o at the Oatman Hotel. Yeah. Uh, it's become such a myth that now they're accepting it as fact. And that drives me crazy. Yeah, you can't. Um, well, you can you can correct it uh, and then recorrect it and correct it again. But at the en end of the day, if people are going to believe it, they're, they're going to believe it. <laughs> and yeah. You have to resign yourself to that fact is that as, as I found, I mean, we always 
we our mantra at True West is print the print the truth, warts and all. Let the yes. audience decide. You know, let, let our readers decide if they if they want to believe it. Because I, you know, in my world, um, there's so many people who believe that Bill was Billy the Kid. You know, and to me, that's laughable. Uh, his family Bible said he was born in 1880, which uh, the kid was killed in 81. So he really would have been a kid. Uh, but you can't dissuade them. And I, I, I just gave up trying to uh, prove them wrong or to get them to uh, change their mind. There's, they just, uh, there's just this whole cult. And a lot of it grew up around the movie uh, Young Guns and Young Guns 2. Of course, the uh, payoff to that film is that uh, the kid didn't die and he ended out his life as, as Brushy Bill. And so that's, that's uh, an example on my side of the table where um, – they're just if enough people believe it, you can't stop them. Well, we can see that. Uh, well, take our politicians, please. Um, <laughs> hey, uh, Greg Hassman over in Albuquerque, he's got a question for. You. He says, uh, "What Wild West event or character would you like to see made into a movie or TV series?" You know, um, I'm working on a character right now that I cannot believe hasn't been a movie and a major character, and that's Mickey Free. He was a young um, Hispanic kid who was kidnapped by Apaches. He, in fact, he started the longest war in the United States history, the Apache Wars, which lasted 25 years. And um, he ended up to be a scout, and his, uh, one of his best friends was uh, the Apache kid, who, of course, was never found. Uh, escaped into Mexico, and no one knows what happened to him. And I think a story that which I'm developing right now uh, on the real uh, le the legend of Mickey Free is the next is the next big story that I think needs to come down the pike. There's so many of his characters. Uh, one uh, what's his name? Uh, Jeff Milton Davis. Is that correct? Oh, Jeff the Milton. One? Yeah, good man with a gun. He was a, a great storyteller. Lived in Tombstone. Was a border guy. He's, yeah, I, lo I love Jeff Milton. The one-armed fella. Gosh yeah, darn, yeah. There's, a, there's a story, too, that uh, I'm surprised by how many of these characters have just slipped through the cracks. And uh, just tremendous stories. And, of course, you grew up with a lot of these real-life characters. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the... Uh, um, I can't say what one of their names. I can't say their name on the. I've already no. I've already used up my swear word for the uh, for your show, uh, but there there's there's some pretty amazing dudes that came out of Kingman, and I uh, and of course, like you said, I grew I grew up with a uh, more than a few of them, and uh, I think the, the the guy that deserves his own TV show is Billy Logos, who was the king of the quarter mile. And um, we would be uh, cruising on a Saturday night in downtown Kingman, uh, probably at the Chemo Cafe. And um, somebody would say, uh, hey, there's some heat in town from Boulder City. And that was code for there's a there's a really fast car that came down from Boulder City and they're looking for somebody to run. And everybody would go out and get Billy Logos. And so everybody would uh, knew that knew the drill. We would go out way, way, way out of town out on Stockton Hill Road, and we'd go past the, the cattle guard, and all these cars would be idling in the ditch in the dark, and here was Billy Logos in his 409 Dodge, and he would come out, and uh, uh, and they would race in, in the dark. You know, I don't, I don't know why nobody was killed uh, doing that. And um, he he was just a legend. And he uh, one time he, he uh, raced, I, I want to say, Hubby Grounds. Hubby Grounds had a... Uh, the Grounds family in Kingman are big ranchers, and Hubby had a 63 fastback Corvette, and uh, they raced, and uh, Billy got beat, and he was so mad, he went home. They lived in Logosville, which was outside of Kingman, and he put a transmission in the back the back of his car and came back and beat him, and I, <laughs> I just love those old stories. You know, that went on for years. You've got a, just a couple of years on me, but uh, uh, we would do that uh, when I was a kid, and uh, here's one. I, I picked up a, a 65 Pontiac uh, 2 plus 2. And uh, Dangerous Dave Register. Dave Register had a reputation. He had some great cars, but they only lasted a couple weeks because he'd run them into phone poles or some abutment or drive them off the road or whatever. But anyway, I had this bright idea. I kept burning the tires off this Pontiac. And so I worked down at, uh, by the uh, Canada Mart at Volkswagen. 
And um, I got this great deal on these steel studded uh, snow tires. I don't know what possessed me to think this would work, but we were downtown one night by the Beale Hotel and I wound up the clutch and I, I dumped that thing and I wound up the motor and dumped the clutch. And there was just a, cl- a bunch of sparks when those steel uh, studs dug into the pavement. Next thing I know, I was going sideways because they had dug into the pavement and ripped the tires off the rim of the car. <laughs> Man. Yeah, I went to jail for that, but that's another story for another day. <laughs> well, you got me chopped there. I can't say I, I went to jail for any of my shenanigans in Kingman, although I probably should have. Um it- but- Go ahead, Bob. Uh, Bob, you're you're working on another book, right? Uh, uh, another Route 66 Kid project. Well, you know what? We're going to do a follow up. Uh, the The 66 Kid is sold out. If you can find one, God bless you. Uh, it's a it's a great read, and we had a lot of fun doing it. I did it with my <clears throat> longtime uh, Kingman friend uh, and the man Harshberger. Uh, we grew up together in Kingman, and he's been my art director. And I was talking to Dan, and I said, you know. I think uh, if we do a second one, we should just stay on the road. The the first one I did is a kind of a quasi memoir of growing up and where I ended up and all this stuff. And I went, you know, uh, I don't want to I don't want to talk about the decline. I don't want to talk about the end. Let's just go with the glories of Route 66, the legends. And um, I want to co-team with Marshall Trimble, who's the um, official uh, historian for the state of Arizona. And he grew up in Asheville. And every time I see Marshall, he's ribbing me about being from Kingman, being a flatlander, as he called me. <laughs> and I, I rib him for being in this little squat town up there that nobody ever stopped at. And uh, he, uh, <clears throat> so he and I are gonna join forces. And uh, he sent me some uh, stories of growing up on Route 66. And I gotta say, I am so impressed. I am so amazed at his ability to spin tales. Here's here's just a taste. So he talked about he, he had two brothers, and they're coming back from Colorado, coming across the, the Navajo Res near Shiprock, and they're in the back seat fighting, and and you know the parents are at wit's end, and so the father uh, sees a hitchhiker, and it's an old Navajo man. And they uh, they pull over, and the Navajo man gets in the back between those boys, and those boys don't make a peep all the way to Gallup. <laughs> and uh, when they get to Gallup, the Indian guy reaches over and he says, "Right over there, they send me, over, let me off right over there." And so they let him off. And um, the mother looks at uh, Marshall's mother looks at her father and said, "Maybe he would drive with us all the way to Ash Fork." And so they. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm ruining it a little. He tells it so well. And we're going to have those kind of stories wall to wall, front to back. Very good. Marshall is a master storyteller. Yeah. He is yeah. Just, no, he, he can't. He can't. He, he's the only guy I know who cannot not tell a story. You, you, you're, you're talking about, hey, Marshall, are you going to be at that event tonight? And then, you, <laughs> you know, that reminds me one time I was at an event and he goes off and tells some fantastic story. I, I just love people like that. I have yeah. always been fascinated. My first job, uh, paid job, was working for old man Edgerton up at Ed's camp below Oatman. And um, I regret to this day, I was being a kid, you know, I just I just didn't have enough sense to pay attention. And that old fella, he drugged me all over those hills and had so many stories to share. And I was just too young to appreciate it. But uh, he was quite a character. He'd come out about 1919. Uh, you know where Ed's Camp is up there? Oh, God, yes. Yeah, yeah. Cla- yeah, classic place. Yeah, I loved Ed's Camp. You know, one of the great stories, and I didn't know this until uh, later years, I met up with Ed again just before he passed. Ed had set up camp there about 1920 at uh, Little Meadows. He got an idea uh he saw all these tourists stopping there along the National Old Trails Road. So he got uh, the Gates family to front him some money, grub staking, and he bought some gasoline in 50-gallon drums that he put up on these uh, uh, pedestal deals. And he started gravity feeding gas into the gas tank, selling gas. And the thing just morphed. It just became a business. And after about eight years, he had a bus stop, a cafe, a rock shop. 
And then he got nervous. He decided he might want to buy the property instead of just squat on it and pretend that he owned it. He didn't even own the property. He just pretended and started building a business on it. Are there any pictures of Ed? Yeah, there's a few floating around. Not a lot. Uh, one turned up the other day on a Kingman forum. Yeah, I'd like to. Uh, I'd like to feature him in the book. Uh, Ed's camp is a legendary place, and um, to have that story would be wonderful. And so, uh, I hope he cashed out and made some money and died happy. He lived into the seventies. Uh, he was a geologist, uh, taught here at the local Mojave Community College for a bit. Uh, uh, the the Buick, I think it's a seventeen or nineteen eighteen Buick that he drove out from Michigan. It's still sitting in the weeds out there at Ed's camp. And uh, yeah, he was he was really quite a character. I think he had an allergy to soap because I don't remember him ever using it much. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but boy, he was a character. Yeah, well, that's, we certainly in Mojave County are not challenged by a lack of characters. There's plen plenty of characters. When we moved out there on Oatman Road, my dad referred to those people as dry roasted nuts. And, yeah. Uh, there were some real strange characters out there in the desert. Oh, yeah. Bob, thank you for doing this this morning. I, I've enjoyed this immensely. And you yeah, get up this to is great. You get up to Kingman next time. I'll, I'll buy the first round of coffee or a cold beer or whatever the preference is. And uh, I'm coming up next month. You're going to be around in April. I got a a history talk at the Fippen Museum in Prescott. And I was thinking about just holding that uh, <clears throat> pedal to the metal and going all the way up to Kingman. So maybe you and I will do a little uh, uh, traveling around the, the old roads and do some storytelling. That would be fun. I'd enjoy that immensely. What dates uh, are you going to be in Prescott? I'm going to be uh, there on uh, April 22nd. So I'll be up the, probably the next day or, or yeah, the, the, probably the, that night and then the next day. And so, you got a couple of days that'd love, love to spend some time on the road with you. Yeah, I'm supposed to be in Prescott. Uh, I think it's the 24th. I've got a German family, some good friends of mine that's coming in, never been to Prescott. And I was going to show them around up there in Prescott. I think that's the 24th, but I'll get Well, the maybe we'll meet on the road and we'll have to stop and swap lies. Oh, God, we could do that for hours. Yeah. Hey, before we button this up, uh, does anybody have any questions for Bob? Bob? Uh, Mr. Greg Hassman that's been talking with us a bit this morning, he's uh, he's a, a great fellow that you should meet sometime, Bob. He's a prolific photographer, very talented, and a passionate traveler, and uh, he collects stories from up and down the road talking to people, uh, Wyoming to New Mexico and every place in between. And uh, he's got quite an interesting resume he's building for a young fella, a real interesting fella. Uh, Bob, again, thank you. And well, we'll do this again next week, about the same time. I got Stephanie Stuckey. We got that ironed out. We'll probably be doing that about April 19th. And, uh, well, in the meantime, we'll give a shout out to our good friends over in Tucumcari at visit tucumcarinm.com. Bob, I do hope we could, our paths will cross in April. Yeah. Good talking to you, Jane. You too. Bob, thank you so much. Bye -bye. All right. Adios. Say hello to a new friend on an old road. Take a two-lane trip of memories into mysteries unknown. To everybody who joined us this morning, I want to thank you. Miss Maggie from, uh, I hope that I hope you're doing okay up here in East Lansing, Michigan. And Nolan, good to see you again. And Keith, always good to talk with you. I'm sure glad everybody enjoyed the program here. Nolan, thank you for those compliments. Mr. Hassman, you keep up the good work here. Vaya que Dios, mi amigos. We'll see you next week.